And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Elizabeth Z. Lacey. Thank you so much, Dr. Lacey. No problem. And you're seeing just the presentation screen, right? Yes. Yes. Looks great. Per perfect. We practice on the other link, so you know you got to make sure. Uh, so yes, thank you for the invitation for the Charm Group. I'm excited about this presentation because. Um, for a multitude of reasons, which I hope I'll reveal to you as we go, but I asked kind of what what do you want me to cover when we're talking about seagrasses? And so she did, uh, Danielle did send out the fact sheet that I created with the Rutgers Cooperative Extension um, just to kind of cover the basics of the differences, but I am going to talk about those briefly um, and uh, talk a bit about the status of seagrasses within New Jersey, uh, the trends that we're seeing um, with some of the growth, decline, expansion, things like that, um, and some of my own, oops, own research efforts. Screens. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is if you're not familiar with who I am, so Elizabeth Lacey, I go by Z. So yes, Dr. Z is what my students call me. You can call me Z. Uh, I work here at Stockton. I've been here for the past 10 years. Prior to that, I worked in the monitoring program down in the Florida Keys, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, running the uh, working in within the uh, monitoring program there, as long as well as the long term ecological research centers in Florida Bay. Um, so I would say that seagrass is in my blood. That's what my PhD was all about. And I've spent pretty much my life's work uh, studying seagrasses and looking at um, how they're doing in different ecosystems. And I would identify it by saying I I'm a big geek when it comes to grass <laughs> and uh, always look forward to interacting with either the public or anyone that has an interest in learning a bit more about this ecosystem. But I broadly define my research interest as looking at those ecosystem services and resilience. And mainly right now, because of you know, how the world is going in our use of aquatic environments is looking at post disturbance recovery. So after we have some type of pulse disturbance or continued disturbance within a community, what is that trajectory of um, decline or recovery uh, within the community? And more importantly, one of my personal goals is to always work towards actionable science, which is why I think this presentation excites me the most, is because when you're involving, you know, regulators and people that are looking at, you know, permitting and mitigation and things like that, I want to be that that conduit where you can identify where maybe the, the data are lacking and I can provide rigorous scientifically backed uh, projects that can support the, the work that we're all trying to do, which is in essence protecting a resource. So where am I located? For those of you that aren't familiar, we're at Stockton University, which is considered like a small liberal arts university. And that's important because we're not um, like a big institution like Rutgers. That's considered an R1, a big research institution. So they have a large budget. They have research faculty rather than teaching faculty. But my job, my primary focus is actually on undergraduate teaching. So every single project I do, I'm incorporating the students. And my full-time job is teaching at the institution and I love being able to kind of incorporate the students into the science so they can see how is this actually going to apply out in these communities that they live. Our field station is located in Port Republic. So the log cabin in that photo, that's actually my lab and my office and our teaching space all rolled into one. And the little red dot here is where that's located. So you'll notice we are not in with PDE or BBP, but I feel like BBP has, the Barnega Bay Par Partnership has adopted me and I appreciate that. Um, so we've got a great facility, a amazing staff, amazing students, um, and that just kind of folds into what I do, teaching marine botany, marine conservation, marine biology, and all those good things. So the little bit of a primer that I'm going to do for seagrasses uh, are looking mainly at, you know, how are they growing? And this comes into play later when we're looking at those disturbances. So the graphic on the upper left is kind of the basics. If you remember from your general biology or botany courses, uh, it's a grass like that's on your lawn, but it's growing underwater. So it needs light, it needs gases, it needs food, um, it needs a soil to grow in. And you can see that all represented in this image so that they're taking up oxygen, taking up CO2, giving off oxygen. Um, they're storing uh, carbohydrates, the sugars in their rhizomes, which they can pull from for subsequent growing events. Um, so very similar to what you would think you're encountering on your lawn. And then the graphic in the lower right, 
Um, when you're talking about a trophic cascade, that was probably one of my biggest um, adjustments moving from Florida or tropical ecosystems where I've got really large herbivores like sea turtles or sea, tur sea urchins. Um, these little guys, amphipods and isopods are represented in this cartoon. Those are our herbivores in the system. So the trophic cascade is a bit different. Uh, most of the fish that are located in Jersey are not herbivores. So a little bit of, of transition there, but they're still, you know, those fundamental processes are still Still involved within a seagrass bed. Now, why should you care? So I stole this graphic from Wildlife Conservation Society. It is based on a tropical ecosystem, but all of these major boxes are still in play. So it's a hub of biodiversity. It's a food source. So you can fish within a seagrass bed and know around here you're getting blue crab, you're getting flounder, scallops, preferentially settle on eelgrass blades. So we need to have them providing oxygen, storing carbon, um, all of the things that you see here. And we'll get to this a bit later, but um, having some type of um, shoreline erosion protection. And that builds into one of the graphics that Barnica Bay Partnership worked with um, squid tunes to create. This is a really great graphic and it's, it's actually even larger and longer. So if you want to want to take a look at it it's through squid tunes at the bottom you can see um, but just the overall value so it, protecting coastal properties reducing erosion through a reduction of wave energy um, and kind of filtering nutrients and um, soils out of the water column so the water's clear which um, they've calculated at about 30 billion dollars per year I always find when I'm talking about conservation if you can't get people like to really care about your your habitat um, you can put googly eyes on it because then they think it's cute <laughs> or you can attach a dollar bill to it. And so I think this is a really good way to get that across for the level of importance. And I think um, I've been a big champion of, well, like I said, geeked out of grass my whole life, but I've been a big champion of it. And I think it's been well received within the community and there's a lot more interest in an understanding. But there are some challenges. So seagrass is not seaweed, and that's where that fact sheet is somewhat helpful. And it was written so that the average, you know, J John Q public could understand it. So feel free to distribute it. Um, when there's a disconnect between what seaweed is versus seagrass, then kind of seagrass gets the bad name. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But in general, if you're looking to tell the difference, um, if it's similar to your lawn grass, like if you see veins in it that are parallel, that's like your grass, that's like a seagrass. Um, it should have very distinct roots. So there's a root mass you can see in the picture on the right, roots and rhizomes. Um, not all seaweeds have even a hold fast. They can be floating. The What I have in my hands in that photo, um, it's all seaweed. Color-ish can be examples. Um, my students would really like it if it were that easy. Uh, but in general, if it's it's more of a red color um, or if it's brown and it's not dead and brown, then we're probably looking more of a seaweed than a seagrass. But there are green macroalgae or green seaweeds and green seagrasses, so that might get a little confusing. Um, and I offer this all the time, and I have ac I've actually had people take me up on it. You can send me a sample. Um, so if you find something and you're not quite sure what it is, um, if you just simply dry it out on a paper towel and then slip it in the mail, you can mail it to me and I will happily rehydrate it and attempt to identify it for you. It's kind of it's kind of a fun challenge when you're a botany geek like I am. So why does it matter? Again, if we're thinking seaweed, so that is my poor student <laughs> um, who's draped herself in a mantle of seaweed. Uh, it's considered a nuisance. Understandably, when boats are driving through, it's getting caught in props. Uh, a lot of our uh, oyster farmers, you know, you get caught in your gear. It's a nuisance um, versus a really valuable asset so that it's forming this habitat. It's it's stabilizing to the shoreline. It's, you know, pr providing a food source. So there's clearly a disparity. So it's important that we understand which is which. Um, fast growing versus slow growing because macroalgae doesn't have the more complicated roots and and um, rhizomes kind of structures. It, it absorbs nutrients from the water column really easily. So if you get a big pulse of nutrients, like if uh, you know stormwater runoff isn't treated, or if you know we didn't have like the Jersey Friendly Yards program that was cleaning up the amount of um, fertilizer you're putting on your lawn, you'd see a big pulse of the seaweed in the community versus seagrasses themselves are really slow growing. And that's going to be important when we're talking about restoration and things like that. 
and then the services being provided. I think I've kind of hit on that enough to know, you know, seaweed doesn't provide as much habitat. They are habitat forming. Um, one of my preliminary studies or some of my preliminary studies were looking at drift macroalgae as a habitat. So you've got the smaller invertebrates or juvenile fish that can use it, but it really absolutely does not take the place of seagrasses because it's not rooted, it's not holding down the soil, and that's a, a really important component of the service that they provide. So regionally, how are our seagrasses looking? What's threatening them? Um, pretty much the same things that are happening regionally are happening internationally. And so part of the groups that I'm involved with, there's an international coalition um, where I work with agencies from West Africa to Europe to Philippines to Australia to all over the all over the coast. Excessive nutrients is a problem, causes those blooms, causes die-offs. You know, it's a grass that needs light that lives underwater. So anything that you put in the water to make it more turbid and less clear means less light for the grass, which is problematic. Um, global warming, there's temperature, to uh, like thermal tolerances that are, are key for some of these species, particularly because where we're at in this temperate area, as it gets warmer, it's going to have a really negative impact on our, our eelgrass. Sea level rise increases how much water is then above the seagrass, which means it's decreasing how much light that they're getting, um, and general population growth, which kind of contributes to the other issues. Locally in New Jersey, that misidentification is, is really key. Um, I, I include this in almost all of my presentations, unless I know it's an audience of seagrass folks. Um, because that misidentification is in a, a really important component to protecting it. You know, if you don't know what it is, then how do you know how vital it is to protect? And so that's an important component. It also comes into play when we're doing, um, when I'm reviewing surveys that others have done for permitting and things like that. I'm not always confident that it's been identified correctly. A general disconnect, if something's underwater, it's hard to really care about it as much as something that you see on land that's dying. And more significantly than ever right now is a lack of dedicated funding and support. So having a line item in state budgets and things like that, uh, that further support mapping monitoring. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So, as I said, I, I do run the SAV monitoring program in New Jersey, and that's funded through Barnegat Bay Partnership. Like I said, they've adopted me as one of their own, even though I'm not technically in, in that watershed. But there are limitations. So the survey itself is, is restricted I don't know how much, hopefully you can see on the map, the blue lines are the locations where the surveys take place. So it's definitely not throughout the entirety of the bay. And it also happens biennially, so every other year. Um, and trends can happen and you you will miss them because it's not happening. And, I, and I've got this, the studies and the surveys to, to show that, unfortunately. So we're monitoring, but like ish, you know, we're, we're getting at least some, some data coming in, but it's not as regular, as frequent um, as myself as an SAV expert would prefer. So what does that look like in our bay in particular? So we have two main species. We have the eelgrass and we have wigeon grass. And wigeon grass we consider a cosmopolitan species because it can exist in freshwater to saltwater versus eelgrass being um, restricted to just the saltwater. So this figure is, and there's a picture in the upper right with um, eelgrass and seeds. So you're looking at from south to north. So BB is Barnegat Bay site one all the way up to 15. So one is down here at the bottom. These um, BB14, MBO1, those are water quality stations. So from one all the way north, we're looking one to 15. So you can see that we've got eelgrass predominantly in the southern end of Barnegat Bay. And then we've got our Wigeon grass predominantly in the northern end of Barnegat Bay. And that has to do with some of those issues. So it's freshwater input, amount of nutrients. This is, you can even see on the map, right? More heavily populated, there's more people. So we've already got some, some stressors happening in the system that it's really important to track the health of the community. And most importantly, um, when you're thinking about the two different species is that they're not equivalent. And this is, this is even more important. So SAV, a lot of times surveys have been done and it's like, is SAV there? Yes or no, especially if they're done ancillarily, if you're collecting shellfish data and it's like a checkbox and you're not really looking at what species are there. Um, there's different uh, life history strategies. So that rupia is the Wigeon grass is considered kind of a boom bust population. You could have a really big growth year and the next year it really dies out. Um, Zostra, the eelgrass is slower growing. Um, the reproductive cycle. So if you pulse a system and have some type of disturbance, 
reproductively, you won't see a change potentially in the eelgrass for two years because of that reproductive cycle. There are differently susceptible to stressors. Light and temperature are two of the major ones for eelgrass. And so when it gets too hot um, and there's not enough light, you'll lose your eelgrass, but our weedy cosmopolitan species, Wigian grass will come in instead. And so that kind of contributes to our distribution patterns. And unfortunately, I have to report that within Barnegat Bay, this is from the last um, State of the Bay report uh, in my SAV monitoring program report from last year, and we'll be revising. Well, so the survey was done in 2021, and then we'll be doing it again in 2023. But the trend at this point, all the red dots indicate where there's an area of decline, and then the relative size of the dot the spot indicates how massive of a decline it is. Suffice it to say, take home message, lots of red dots. If it's yellow, it was neutral, there wasn't really a change. And if it's black, there was no eelgrass there. Because remember, this northern area is when there's not much eelgrass at all. Same story, unfortunately, for Wigian grass. So even our weedy cosmopolitan species, we're still trending a decline here. And um, this was a project that I worked on or a presentation. Um, one of my former students, so Danielle Dyson, did an amazing job putting together these figures with me. And she worked with me um, for quite a few years during her, her bachelor's degree uh, here at Stockton. And so, you know, we were working at how do we visually represent so that you can kind of get the take home message pretty quickly. And as we populated the map, Unfortunately, it you know became pretty evident that we do see trending declines over the years that I've been running the monitoring program here in Barnegat Bay. So why? I mean, that's a, a kind of obvious next question. Um, and it comes down to, to a few things. The first being us. I mean, I feel like we're kind of the fault of all of those things, but the physical disturbance, so a direct like from prop scars. And so part of that squid tunes, um, graphic that Barnica Bay Partnership came up with was the fact that, you know, you've got boats that run aground and those scars stay around for quite a bit. Um, the bottom right graphic or a photo in this case is from they were building a bridge, essentially construction projects that have a necessary footprint for what they need to do, um, which is to serve the public, but does cause a destruction in, in the seagrass. The nutrients, so having too many nutrients causes those blooms of, of seaweed, causes epiphytes, which is that cover, that, that kind of brown coat, we call it, um, on top of the seagrass beds. So it means that they're not getting enough light. And then the change in climate. So as I mentioned before, temperature and sea level rise. And this is where my first kind of struggle is um, as a researcher is this first component, this prop scars and construction, because there seems to be a disconnect between some of the regulations that are currently in place for New Jersey, as well as as it relates to reproductive biology and physiology. So uh, requiring mitigation to occur immediately after a disturbance doesn't make sense in terms of SAV, reproductive biology and physiology, because it takes a while for that plant for you to see what that response might be. And as in particular, the soils are so important for where we see seagrass growing. If you've done something in the, the system that's going to alter the types of soils there, you really don't want to do mitigation, meaning planting or putting out seeds until you know how is that system equilibrated? How is a natural system responding to that? Because the goal of that mitigation, right, is to, to replace what's been lost. But how do you know the system can still support seagrass? Just because it did before, great, but now you've done something to the system. So let's see what the system does first before we potentially I always say don't sacrifice seagrass, don't put out seeds there, don't put out shoots there because we don't know that they're going to live. So, you know, why why follow through with that? And that's where I'm trying to understand how I can work with regulators um, about integrating um, some of the seagrass biology and the reproductive ecology into what the goals are, which is to make sure that we're protecting the resource and at all, you know, at any and all costs, but when some of these damages happen for these necessary projects, you know, what does that look like in the longer term? So for the future of SAV, um, protection, right? Like the first step is let's just not destroy it. <laughs> um, so we've got a marine conservation zone um, and the, the map on the right, Save Barnegat Bay put together uh, with the idea of being just eliminate the amount of traffic that's coming through because the that figure there, that's again from the squid tunes that Barnegat Bay Partnership did. Um, I like it because, you know, it's the boat propeller. And then if you can see, there's like dollar bills coming out. 
So safe boating skills, because if you're running aground, you're destroying this resource, which means that you're getting less of the flounder back that you want to eat, less of the scallops, less of the blue crab. So um, protection is obviously the first goal is let's let's reduce how much destruction is happening from things that we can control, knowing that there's a lot of things that are out of our control. The second effort is monitoring and mapping. We have to know where the resource is so that we can protect it. We also need to know how much of the resource is there so that our efforts to protect or restore, how do we, what's our benchmark to know how we achieved that goal? And I know we've really struggled with that. Um, I'm also chair of the science um, committee with Barnegat Bay Partnership about, you know, what are those metrics? You know, what does that habitat restoration plan look like? So we're somewhat monitoring for health, like I said, data gap-ish and that it's biannual. It's very limited at those particular sites. So it's at least we're doing something, which is great. Um, monitoring or doing some type of experiment to look at ecosystem services. As I mentioned, widgeon grass and eelgrass can perform very different functions. And so we are not even quite sure within our own bay how are they performing those functions? Do fish, for example, find different, pref do they prefer different types of habitats such that if um, we do get a switch to more of the Wigeon grass within the bay, are we going to lose some associated fish species? And um, what's exciting is that we've had a bit of a delay with COVID, but um, Jim Vesleides and I, uh, through New Jersey Sea Grant, are going to be doing a project this summer kind of trying to tease apart what those differences might be as they perform that really important service for, for fish habitat, essential fish habitat. And then the last gap is mapping. Um, if you ask any bayman, <laughs> any um, aquaculture person that works in the bay, I'm, I, I feel like I get the bad rap because they hate SAV because it prevents them from doing some of the things that they'd like since there is a reliance on these maps from 1978. There's been some updates since 2009. Um, but it's a pretty significant data gap, and I'm happy to say that we are working forward. So again, like I said, Barnegat Bay Partnership is really, you know, coming in to, to assist with a lot of these. But in this case, also partnering with the Department of Environmental Protection um, to, to update those maps. So one of the projects that I have this summer is working with Rick Lathrop, who did the original, well, not the 1978 maps, but the more recent maps um, to do the aerial imagery, and then I'll be doing the field verification uh, to update those maps and make those available. So there's an effort there, but again, it's it's at least to get us to this point. Um, but what does that look like for the future? And where is that funding coming from? Because doing a map in 2023, you, you need to keep doing mapping. Seagrass beds move and they change. And if we want to get an idea of how are we doing with our resource, you have to continually invest those funds to keep those up to date. And then the other option or the other movement is towards restoration, which I would have to say is probably the biggest and most alarming gap because the, so many projects are happening in the Bay and there's not a lot of restoration happening, mostly because we're not even at the point where we have an idea of where and how. So, why is SAV absent is the first question. And I put that graphic back up there again to remind you, you have to have the right soil. You have to have the right light. You have to have the right nutrients, the water column, the depth, the temperature. So all of those factors. Sometimes you know why it's absent, right? There was a construction project. Um, there was a boat grounding. So you have a very clear idea. This is why it's gone. Um, but sometimes in the regulations, it's that you can only restore in areas where it's not currently growing which to me doesn't make sense. It's like going out on your lawn and underneath the tree, there's no grass growing. So I can put some grass there and it's gonna grow magically. No, it's not growing there for a reason. And so understanding exactly why it's absent is so key to choosing a site. And if you don't know in particular why, then maybe that's not the site that you need to choose. And so choosing where to restore <laughs> is important. And this is just, it's a simple model. Believe me, it's a simple model. Um, in the middle is SAV habitat. So what you're going for, which is habitat that will support SAV growth. And the main factors coming in are light, temperature, hydrology. So the movement of water around the seagrass bed and then soil. And soil is something that I've been really focusing a lot with my research and kind of collating a database that can be more predictive because soils don't move as much. It takes a really large storm event, and the last would have been Sandy, 
to change the composition of the soil in such a way that it wouldn't support seagrass growth anymore. Soil also reflects hydrology, the movement of water. And so um, you can see I've, one of my students is holding a core in her hands. Um, I really have been pushing this with all of my research projects to further make that database, database more robust. Um, but for us to understand that in choosing future sites to restore, the first step is to actually just take some soil samples. If there's not grass growing there, let's just look at the soils first. Is it even conducive? Because it would be hard to come up with um, a restoration plan where you have to put out all new soil and try to, to plant your seagrass or put some seeds out. And that comes to the last step, which is how do you actually restore? Um, so the Chesapeake is always given as this great example, um, and they're light years ahead of where we're at. They've they've managed to to work on restoration within um, the Chesapeake, and they did it mostly by seeds, uh, which it doesn't always work in all environments. You can also use seedlings. You can use adult plants. Um, it's about choosing the right method for where you're planning to actually hopefully grow the seagrass um, and why is the seagrass absent to begin with. So you wouldn't put out seeds if there's really high currents because the seeds are just going to flush out. Um, if there's not enough light, you know, and you're transplanting a seagrass from an area that has plenty of light to an area without light, it's not going to do well. Um, and so the, the goals that we have within New Jersey of doing restoration are a bit thwarted in that the how to restore, we're still learning from. Um, there's a lot of, not a lot of, not enough, there's a few pilot projects and we're, we're getting at better answers to that. And I'm gonna show you the restoration project that I'm currently working on. Um, but we need more of these types of even pilot projects to apply the science in a way that we can learn from and scale up at the, the level that we need to offset some of these projects that have destroyed you know, acres of seagrass. So that being said, um, the, the one project, most current project that I have with restoration is actually looking at a dual habitat restoration. So we are looking both at putting out oysters as well as eelgrass at a site that's um, behind Beach Haven and the Sedge Islands there, the Southern Sedge Islands, there's some of the Northern end common name, Sedge Islands. Um, so the idea here is that the site didn't support it in that, that model that I had. You know, I assessed all of these characteristics, looked at the soils, and it had really high flow. So we were checking a lot of the boxes for the light, for the soil, hydrology, temp, but the currents were going through too fast. So the hypothesis was, well, we put down these oyster berms, and it's going to assist in slowing the current enough that by putting out seed, they'll actually be able to root and establish themselves. We also have the added benefit that if there's an oyster reef there, not only do you have another habitat, so you're thinking more holistically about the ecosystem. What have you lost? You've lost habitat. Well, let's try and build up too. By putting out these oyster reefs, they're going to be filtering the water. They're going to be drawing in different types of fish. So there's an additive component that could be considered in this particular research project. And again, a very, you know, rigorous uh, project with scientific standards applied to it, hypotheses and replicates so that to me, the goal was actionable science. Again, if what we pull out of this is not something that can be actionable, if scaling it up means it would be a billion dollars to an acre of seagrass, it's not realistic. So let's just do this as a, a test plot to see, does this theory even work? And so I worked with Dr. Christine Thompson, um, who's here at Stockton, and uh, did some spat that were set on whelk shell. We wanted that increased rugosity. A, a whelk shell is much larger than normally you would put them on an oyster shell. And so set the spat on the shell and then put them out on the reef and, uh, to create these berms in a reef. And she used about, um, her estimate, 0.995 million oysters. No, you don't count every one of them. You, you do kind of get a, an approximate. So about a million oysters. And then I went out as part of the Department of Transportation's mitigation plan for the Route 72 bridge. Um, there was already a system in place where I was collecting seeds and using that. And that was what they were finding to be most beneficial in their mitigation project thus far. And so the idea is that you go out and these are not my photos. I forget who I stole them from, but um, you collect the seeds and then they have them in a spathe. So almost imagine a, an ear of corn that has the husk over it. And so you're gonna put that into a tank and that husk is gonna naturally rot away. And then you'll just be left with the, corn, the kernels. 
And so for my portion of it, she did a million oysters and then I did a million of the eelgrass seed. And you can see that in the little vial that I'm holding in the bottom right, that's a million, um, not, no, that's not a million. The million actually fit in a really small bucket, which was somewhat terrifying when I went to get the seeds that that was my responsibility. It's like the whole world in my hands right there. Um, so uh, a million were planted out at the site. So with a million oysters and a, um, a million eelgrass seed, I say this joke often, and I don't think she's ever been at one of my presentations where I can harass her and that the eelgrass is winning. <laughs> um, the oysters have not been doing so well. And so these, this is again, preliminary results. Our final report is going through the DEP. So I'm not able to, to release that at this point, but we were able to grow eelgrass at the site. Here we have our students that were equally ecstatic to find it out there. So it is growing. It did succeed in the first year, but asterisk, big asterisk, right? Preliminary information. And so, you know, we're looking at whether oysters can help the eelgrass, you know, take root, but this is preliminary data. So yes, it grew. We planted the seeds two years ago. We monitored last year and the eelgrass was there, as you see in that photo, but we've got a couple year cycle and it's really only going to work if the, the shoots that grow produce seed and then they're going to seed back into the bed. So huge asterisks, like this is not a huge win at this point. It's just we're gathering data, right? So everything that I have, the goal is, even if it's a technical report, because it's very, it's difficult to get things published if it's a failure, but um, if hopefully it doesn't happen, if the eelgrass doesn't survive any longer, you know, I still have, we have rigorously documented it so that this information can be used for future res restoration actions. Even then, it's not applicable across the entirety of the bay. Remember, you had to know all of those factors before you would even choose a site to mitigate. I studied this site for two years before we selected it. Like, this is not, and the regulation fra regulatory framework, you know, it's, you can't build that in. Like, they want a mitigation plan immediately, and, and there's a lot of back information or history that you need to know that's lacking, as you saw, the data gaps for SAB. The other area, and this is where um, I'm going to do a case study to round things out, is looking at living shorelines. Um, so that was one of the topics I think we're going to discuss in the future, like different methods for the charm group. There's a lot of interest in that. This idea of habitat trade-offs, um, the loss of one ecosystem, is that okay if you're gaining another? And I would say no, it needs to be like this very comprehensive, again, holistic idea of what you're considering within the ecosystem. So some of the areas in, in red are where I've been struggling um, in trying to apply a scientific standard to it, a hypothesis, you know, data collection um, are in red. So the first issue sometimes is monitoring. So very frequently there's pre-monitoring, you know, do a baseline survey and then you do your whatever intervention for your living shorelines and then you do a post survey. Potentially then there's an additional year of funding. But with the life cycle, the reproductive ecology, the physiology of seagrasses, that's not the end of the story. You, I, I don't want people to then make assumptions. Well, at year two, it's a decline, so this whole system's tanked. Or a year two, everything looks fine, it's great. You really, to me, I mean, my, my dream world is that everybody does 10 years of monitoring. Um, but I think five years does give an idea because of that cyclical nature. And I know that because I've been monitoring the bay, the SAV in the bay long enough that I see the cyclical nature in eelgrass. So five years, you know, it gets you through some of those humps to see what's the trajectory. And you put it in the context, obviously, of all the other sites I've been monitoring. The other issue that I've been hitting is with permitting. So again, I don't permit, I just, I do the science. I'm trying to apply science so that we can learn and future projects can benefit. Some of the struggles that I've had with the New Jersey is the survey guidelines are not equivalent to the SAV metrics that we use in the industry, in academia. So if I wanted to compare the, the amount of seagrass in one environment to national databases, and I'm build, I, build with these international groups, international databases, it's against the best practices for SAV. So it's hard for me to put the New Jersey, if I'm to follow the New Jersey survey guidelines, it's hard for me to put it in the context of how other seagrass beds are doing. So you can see how there's a mismatch there. Um, the other issue, sometimes the sample size, uh, the requirements might not be rigorous enough to actually get its statistical significance because the beds are pretty heterogeneous that they, they are changing constantly, um, you have to increase your sample size, which 
increases the cost, increases the time, which I know a lot of people don't want, especially when they're permitting. Soil analysis, it's not required um, because there's not been the, that connection so clearly before, uh, but and, and forms a really important component for the, the ecosystem. Shoot density as well. Um, it can be really difficult for shoot density. I know um, between my master's and my PhD, I worked at an environmental consulting firm. Um, it was short lived because it seemed very much like here are the regulations. Well, this is the bare minimum we have to do. And maybe, I, you know, I was fresh eyed and I was like, but that's not the best way to do things. That's not getting at the question that we're asking, which is what is going to be the impact. And shoot density is one of those things that it can be difficult as a contractor because you have to go in the water and actually count the shoots. In New Jersey, I mean, in I was did the environmental consulting in Florida where the water's a lot clearer. Uh, so maybe you could do it from the surface, but in New Jersey, you need to get in the water. Your face needs to be like right up against the seagrass bed in order to do the shoot density. So it can be really difficult um, to make sure you're getting those shoot densities. And then, as I mentioned before, identification skills. Um, you would hope that anyone doing a survey knows the difference, but there's been times when um, so one of the responses for eelgrass is that width of the blade can actually thin when it's stressed. And one of the key characteristics that people use um, if they're not in, you know, studying SAV for identifying the widging grass is the width of the blade compared to the eelgrass. So you could see how you're stressed the eelgrass, it's thinning, and now, oh, it looks really similar to the widging grass. So photos aren't going to do it. I physically have to touch them. Like I've had students bring me samples and I've had to feel them because well, I can know at this point, but you know, it can be difficult from images. So that identification skills is really a, has proven to be a challenge. And then the last is the mitigation, like I said, where and how, um, what does that even look like? Um, should should they be planting in a certain area, even though we don't know any of those um, baseline conditions when it might mean that we're just kind of stealing from one bed and putting it in a place that it might not live. And so as a researcher, I'm trying to figure out what questions would be helpful to get us to that point and what do regulators want to know or what are they wanting to require during the permitting process and how can I assist in providing the scientific information for that? I don't know if you wanted me to stop at all, Danielle. I have the case study and that's it. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Um, just a couple more slides, I promise. Um, so I do want to bring up, this is the case study that I felt like, um, and Danielle and I talked about it, and even Captain Al, um, this I felt really epitomized a lot of the struggles that I've had applying science to these types of projects, particularly the living shorelines. So you'll see the, the figure on the left um, is a map looking at the proposed locations, and that's the orange, you see these orange zigzags. And again, I'm not going to focus on, it's just, in your head, just shoreline intervention. Apply whatever you're using at your system, whatever you're familiar with. I don't want to focus on that because I know we're going to do talking about different options for shoreline stabilization later. There's an intervention that's going to happen at this site. It's going to be in the footprint of where SAV is. So obviously the first step is do a survey of SAV so you know what the potential impacts would be from this construction activity. So the transect lines are all placed out um, based on me wanting to cover the, the area as in-depth as possible. And that's where I've really increased the replicates and the spatial coverage way beyond what would have been required given the normal guidelines, because I know statistically I can't get there because the bed is so heterogeneous. And the other thing that I've added, these yellow stars are all soil collections. So I had the woman that made the map for me, I said, just randomize and choose soil spots throughout this section so that we've got you know the number of replicates that I need but they're representative of the entire area and the other thing that uh, the last thing that I did was actually just to, to standardize the procedure so again taking the metrics in a way that I know as an SAV expert are useful in the field of SAV research so that we can apply them and say okay this area has this density which is equivalent to what we're finding in other regions um, rather than using like I said the 16 grid for I'm not sure how that was established at some point um, but I, this is more useful in the industry now so you know things change they need to be updated so that's what the goal was um, like I said American Literal Society came out and they did the project of putting in you know the shoreline stabilization part of it 
And so what did that look like? We had the preliminary survey first, and that was two years ago. COVID brain. I'm like, what year was it? And then last year was then the update. So this figure here on the left, this is the 2021 coverage. And so you can see that the red is all where there were there were no seagrasses. Then you can see at the northern end, you see a really high concentration. That darker blue color means that you've got, you know, 50 to 60 percent cover in these areas. And the remainder is like one to five percent. That's that orange color here and a little bit down here in this other region. Again, you can see these are the placements of that shoreline intervention. And while there originally was um, one up in this northern area, it was eliminated because that's where the healthiest bed is. And so let's not destroy that. Yes, the shoreline needs to be protected, but let's just see if we can do it without destroying more of this really important resource. So now we follow up in 2022. And so the, the gray hash here, the black, that's where it was in 2021 to give the reference. And you can see that there's been um, a bed fragmentation is, is essentially what's happened here. So you still have that nice concentrated patch, which makes sense because we didn't have the disturbance there. We protected it. Um, and you've got then potentially a seed source that can ensure that this bed doesn't die off. But you have seen a significant decrease and now it's fragmented. So you've got one, two, three fragments from what used to be a continuous bed. And if it's a fragment of a bed, it doesn't provide the same services that it, an intact bed does. Same thing down here. So you've got, you know, this black hashed areas where it was previously, and now you've lost it almost completely and you've got two small patches. Um, so it's fragmented, which is, you know, obviously an area of concern. And you, the overall decline went from 42% to 26% coverage in those areas that had seagrass. So it's not that this site is going to die and be miserable. No, this is only two years, but there's no more funding for this because that's what is required. Um, and our even our like our grant proposal system, it's the whole system is broken in, in regards to this plant takes longer. It's longer lived, so it takes longer to respond. And after two years, you're not going to have me say that this is going to die off. This was terrible. It was a failure. No, I'm never going to say that as a scientist. The data are these data are not there. Um, but it's an important component to consider that, OK, this is not what we had hoped, right? Um, the other thing component, again, the soils, remember I mentioned how important they are, and if you think of nothing else after this is about how important soil is. Um, so this is my student, Aaron. They they all learn to love their course. Uh, so this is the, the, the figure on the left now is looking solely at the, the cores. So each of these spots here are indicative of where soils were collected. And if it's a red circle, it means that the sand content decreased. And so that's what the seagrass really likes sand. If there's too much of the smaller grains, it becomes sulfuric and it's toxic for the seagrass. They'll rot, they won't be able to grow. So just think sand good, everything else not so good. So if it's red, it means that you decreased your sand content. If it's a green plus, it means you increased. And then if it's a, a triangle with, that's empty, then there was no change. And so this bump out here, emphasizes the the sites that had the most significant change in that sand content and this first one is our only good story here um, is that there was an increase in sand so you can see roughly half 50 percent sand and then the others are silt and clay if you're wondering if you're not if you're not josh and know your soils um, and the other part is about 75 percent sand so we did see an increase but unfortunately at these other three sites we did see a decrease in sand content i mean substantial look at these guys substantial decrease in sand content which means that that's not really a region that's going to be supportive of sav growth or recruitment in the near future unless we can alter the sand content or if it alters naturally again that trajectory of recovery this is only one year post so i don't it's two points <laughs> if you really want to have a trajectory you need at least three and that's where i'm saying i want five because i want to be confident that you know i could say this this method will definitely work because after the first year it doesn't do so hot but it starts to recover so we need the, those additional data points to determine what will actually happen um, longer term at the sites. So grain size is really important for where we're end up, we'll end up seeing seagrass potentially in the future. So with that, I do, I'll wrap up. 
um, and thank, I'm sure I'm forgetting people and I apologize as who I am. This, these projects only happen through these collaborations um, and, and allowing me either on the site prior to or humoring me when I want to do way more replicates than potentially are requested. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Z. That was fantastic. You like covered it all from the biology to uh, impacts of restoration work. And I started writing down questions, but you were answering them as we went <laughs> along. So um, thank you. It sounds like we have a lot to consider when we think about SAV. And that um, wave climate sounds like it might be impacting soils. And that's definitely something we need to consider um, when we're monitoring is to make sure we're, we're getting those soil samples. Um, I'll take one or two questions, but I want to leave enough time for our other speakers. So, um, does anyone have a, a question? Can, can I comment real quick? It's Kat Mel. Sure. So, thanks, Dr. Z, for showing this. And it, it, I think it really gives support to the fact that we need some long-term kind of monitoring here. Uh, the first was the baseline. This was one year after the product is in place, pretty much, which like Dr. C said. So we're seeing a reaction. And to me, it, it's, it's kind of similar to what we see when we do marsh restoration. It looks really crappy at first. And then over two, three years, four years, you start really seeing a change in, in what's happening there. So Doc Z and I have talked quite a bit about this and looking at what's the trend and the trajectory of from this restoration moving forward. And what are next steps? Is it actually amending the substrate with sand, you know, that three or four inches that we talked about and figuring out exactly where um, to place that sand to feed it to where it needs to go. Uh, again, stocking could help us with that, you know, when we do our, our more physical kind of elevations and currents and things like that and waves and all that kind of stuff, that, that kind of surveying. So, you know, conceptually, and, and the idea here is that, yeah, we will see denser beds, if the sediment changes, I know like at Seaside Park, let me talk, Dr. Z, that's 90% pretty much the sediment needed for establishment of SAV. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen there, but we need to find out what's going to happen at Fork of River Beach too. So I appreciate you talking about that and using it as a case study. And hopefully year two, we'll see a bigger change. And then by year five, if we're funded through all that, which we're trying to find funding now to keep the monitoring going, it's only, you know, from what Doc Z said, about 15 grand a year to do this, but the information we get is priceless. So thanks, guys. Just wanted to say that. Thank you. I, I have a quick question. I saw one hand up, but it went away. Um, I think, it, yeah, Kira had her hand up, I thought. Yeah, that was me. Thank you. Um, oh, Kira. Uh, so I guess at some point, Z, maybe you and I should catch up offline to um, talk about the SAV survey guidelines that you're referring to, because there's a possibility that what you might have been provided with in the past is something that we also no longer recommend. So there's a possibility that there's been a mismatch there. Um, I know for the most part, we've been operating with some general guidelines over time, but mostly they have been you know, uh, far broader, meaning if you can provide systematic, comprehensive coverage, quantitative sampling methods, et cetera, et cetera, those are certainly welcome. So nobody is locked into a particular survey methodology. So I just want to make sure that um, if by chance you've been given something, you know, five or six years ago, we have made some updates to that. And certainly your recommendations on other ways of providing definite collection methods, definite parameters is very welcome. Yes, thanks, Kara. Yeah, Russ and I have been talking about that as well. Great. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys are connecting on that. Yeah. Um, I have one one quick question regarding some of the SAV loss at that Forked River site. Just, just knowing how that site was built, it seems like that loss was where the boats kind of went through. There was a lot of, there was more disturbance in that area than any other. Is that an, an example of we need to see what the soils do here and kind of settle out. And do you expect an increase in the future in that area? Or do you think there's another driver? Um, Not really. No, it's not where, where the boats have. I, I mean, no, I would say the decline really is because of the construction activities, because you're physically going out there and placing something. And then people were walking out to place the shell in there. So it's like if you kept trampling across your lawn, like you're going to see a decrease, like it's going to die off from that purpose. 
So that's kind of the first level of where that, that decrease could have been caused from. Then the second level is the turbidity, the soil. So it's being resuspended. If we've got finer grained material, it means that it's more easily to be resuspended and then smother down on the seagrass, as well as you're then changing the composition of the soil to something that the grass doesn't even want to grow in. So I, I wouldn't, and there's not, I wouldn't, there's not a lot of boats that go through there. There's people like, People use that area, but not really, and I don't, I don't have a photo of it out at the site, but I think most of the decline is caused by the initial activities, which is, then you would expect that response for it to recover, right? Like, it's a disturbance. If everything else is still good, you would expect that grass to come back. My concern is that we are changing the soils in such a dramatic way, and is that is that going to persist over time such that more of the sites shift to the negative, meaning less sand, or is that still part of this settling after construction? Yeah, that makes sense. Great. Well, we will have time for more questions and discussion at the end, um, but I do want to turn it over to our next speaker. We have Kelly Summers from EPA talking about some of her work uh, in the Delaware River. So um, while she's loading her presentation, we'll just hang time. Everyone, I'm just going to share this. Um, and then I just want to confirm everyone can see. Can Looks everyone fine. see my presentation? OK. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction again. I'm Kelly Summers. I work at the EPA Region 3 office, which is the Mid-Atlantic States. Um, our office is based in Philly. I'm in the Water Division. And then my co-authors slash partners in crime um, are also on the call today. And they are Todd Ludi and Mike Manzolino. And they are in our Lab Services and Applied Science Division. And for those who um, know how EPA is structured, our, our uh, neighbors to the right of us in Jersey are actually not in our region. They're in region two, but um, you know, we do partner with them when we can. So um, just gonna, some of you I actually saw on the line have probably seen this presentation. So feel free to tune me out if you've heard this all before, but I'm excited to be here. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about this project that the EPA has been working on since 2017. Um, this project started as an internal EPA um, partnering opportunity that we have with our Office of Research and Development. I'm sure you guys have heard of EPA's ORD. Um, regional scientists have the opportunity to apply for internal EPA funding to partner with our Office of Research and Development on a specific um, regional issue. And the kind of inspiration and impetus of this project is one of my positions at EPA is I sit on the Science and Technical Advisory Committee for the National Estuary Programs in the region, of which there are um, four in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and in 2014, I believe, was a white paper that the Delaware Estuary National Estuary Program put out listing um, a top monitoring needs um, list. And on that was um, understanding and monitoring submerged aquatic vegetation and how it interacts with benthic communities. So that's kind of where this project um, came about. Um, so we don't really need to go too much into SAV and the services because Dr. Z covered it great, but, you know, obviously we'll just touch on it really quickly that, you know, why do we care about submerged aquatic vegetation in the, in the um, Delaware estuary? They provide many critical ecosystem services, shoreline stabilization, nursery habitat, wave attenuation, all the good things. But despite all of these benefits, um, as of like before 2017, there really was no comprehensive study or effort to quantify SAV in the watershed. Um, and, you know, it also, so all these services, we really wanted to understand better and have a systematic approach to quantifying SAV in the Delaware. And it's kind of a funny system, I'll go back, because SAV, um, or the Delaware is a really natural turbid system. So in other, in other watersheds, you know, um, you might be able to actually see the SAV gr growing through the water, but in the Delaware, you put your hand in the in the river and uh, you lose vision of your hand right away. So there is kind of a common knowledge or, or an understanding that some people believe that, you know, there really wasn't SAV in the Delaware. 
So typically, quantifying SAV is also assessed by annual flights, um, aerial imagery, things like that. Um, but unfortunately, due to our unfavorable water clarity, um, due to the turbid nature of the Delaware, it really wasn't a feasible option or a reliable method for quantifying SAV. So instead, um, we uh, took the approach of hydroacoustics as the most suitable and effective method for detecting SAV. So to quantify SAV in the Delaware, we used a single beam echo sounder and the um, device we used was by a company called Biosonics and we used the MX Habitat echo sounder. It's specifically geared towards um, SAV and it was used to detect. Um, the transducer is attached to the side of our boat, just like in the picture you see here, and uh, sounds are set down through the water column. And then when the sediment or the sound encounters an object, such as SAV, or bottom sediment, it echoes off the surface. And then those um, those uh, pings we collect on our boat using um, proprietary software. And the kind of approach we took was um, presence absence. So we trod along on the boat and I'll show you what we did. So the pattern we use is to delineate the beds is like considered kind of like we call mowing the lawn. So what we did was we went um, along the shoreline edge and then we're, when we got um, positive pings back, which you can see in this top image where you get this um, uh, response from the sound waves that you can see SAV and a reflection of the beard, we then would do these tighter turns in the bottom image you can see in the middle where we would then go up and down, up and down and sort of mow the lawn to delineate that bed. So in the in the beginning of this project in 17, 2017 to 2019, the original two year project, our goal was to actually map the entire Delaware River estuary, working from the head of tide up in Trent, New Jersey, all the way down to the mouth of the bay. Unfortunately, we did not find SAV really south of the max turbidity zone, the mixing zone around the Delaware Memorial Bridge in the Wilmington area. Um, Wilmington like Newcastle area. So in 2020, um, we decided to focus really all of our attention and our annual surveys into the freshwater tidal Delaware River. Um, due to time and limitations, uh, we just really um, kind of uh, just focused after that point from Trenton, New Jersey down to about Wilmington, Delaware area. There are a couple of reasons why we might not have found seagrasses in the meso and polyhaline. One is that perhaps historically species like Zostra was never in the system. Another was that we were not looking at the right time or in the right locations. However, just again, time and resources were a factor. So then we just, so we had to um, refocus our studies um, moving on from 2020. And again, with Biosonics, there's a bunch of proprietary software. So we use their um, their software called Visual Aquatic and Visual Acquisition to collect the data and then process the data. While we were in the field, when we did get positive pings, we would drop a telescoping rake just to confirm that what we were seeing on our computer and then the results from the ping were in fact reflecting what was going on underwater. So we raked and you can see in this photo, we found some vallicinaria. Um, and then we, um, while species composition was not one of our original parameters in the study, our parameters were really, um, uh, the spatial distribution and density of SAV. But when we were raking and we could um, identify species and pull them up on the boat, we did. Um, we did find a, a decent amount of biodiversity. However, again, we did not really focus on species identification. So, you know, we kind of take this information with a grain of salt. Um, we do really want to focus on getting a better sense of the um, species diversity in the Delaware River um, and really focus on that in the future. But here's just a couple photos of some of what we found. I believe we found about eight different species with the greatest diversity um, north of Philly and south of Trenton. So EPA does have a scientific dive unit. Um, the team was able to go out. We established a couple um, long-term uh, monitoring beds um, where we had some significant um, spatial density and diversity. So uh, the team does, we'd use quadrats to determine the percent coverage um, and noted if we saw bivalves. Divers did have some pretty significant dif difficulties doing it um, due to low visibility, the strong currents, heavy accumulation of fine sediments. Um, 
but when we could get divers out, we did go out and have them get photos. This is probably the best photo we've ever gotten in the Delaware. Um, so we're not seeing much there. The divers could really only dive at slack tide. So it's a challenge, something that we need to consider in the future for like long-term monitoring. So after the data is collected, it's post-processed again using Biosonics Visual Aquatics, which was formerly known as Visual Habitat, if any of you guys have used this before. The, the software interpolates the data into two phases. First, the program auto detects and delineates the bottom surface, drawing the hard bottom, providing the bathymetry for the area, and then some editing is required in like the dense SAV beds, as you can see in this photo. So then, um, after you can kind of go through and, and fix that bottom with a pen tool that's in there. And then the same process goes with the vegetation, the top of the vegetation. Again, it will auto detect it once the bottom's done. And then you can um, manually edit areas where it's kind of jumbled. Uh, the data is then exported to a CSV and it can be loaded into a GIS or any sort of database management system. I'm not going to go into like too much of the nitty gritty details. I only know I only have like five or 10 minutes here. Um, so just some preliminary results. We use the DRBC um, water quality monitoring program locations or water quality zones as kind of the way we separate it out and chunk the data. Um, you can see that zones two and four were the most dense um, looking at that map. And then um, one new um, document that was just put out by the Delaware Estuary National Estuary Program is their um, their state of the estuary report called the technical report for the um, Estuary and Basin, also known as the TREB. This is the first year they included SAV in it. Um, Mike and myself worked on it. Uh, we're calling it a trial indicator report because we really only collected data from 2017. And of that, um, we have really only focused the last couple years on, on the area. And with COVID, we weren't able to do full surveys. So we're, we couldn't really um, confidently start talking about trends or interannual variability, but you know, long term, we'd like to really focus on that. But we did include some preliminary data and observations. So, I, if anyone wants to kind of dive further into our methods and some of our results, um, I'd say check out the TREB. It's all available online. We also have a web application. Um, there's a link here. I can put it in the chat, or Mike or Todd can put it in the chat. Um, all of our data is publicly available. Um, again, it's all right on GIS online. So um, if you're interested in getting the data, downloading the data, seeing the data, um, I urge you to use our app. Um, our GIS team has been fantastic helping us get it posted online. And um, just some like kind of future next steps, you know, we've been inventorying the data since 2017, but um, there are some actions and needs that we've kind of identified um, moving the project forward and kind of continuing to grow the project. Um, obviously, I talked a little bit about species inventorying and their distribution. We really need to understand how much diversity is out there and if there are any drivers to that diversity. Um, the big one is understanding habitat suitability. What are what are really the requirements and needs in the Delaware to um, have SAV thrive for potential restoration and planting in the future? So that will bring me, I think, to my last second last slide. Um, we are working on a proposal internally right now to actually develop some habitat requirements for SAV. Um, our goal is to really evaluate a suite of different metrics in the Delaware, physical, chemical, and biological, to really get a better sense of what is required for SAV to continue to grow and thrive, um, what do they need, um, what are the drivers, and then that way this could, this this habitat suitability analysis could really lead to um, where future um, restoration projects and pilots could be um, done. So we can really say, you know, this area is supportive, this area is not, and we really don't have that information right now. So that's a goal we have moving this project forward. Um, we will continue to keep this group apprised if that project does move forward. We are partnering with our um, EPA counterparts in Region 2 on this. Um, so that's something we're really looking forward to. Again, we'll let you know if we can get that project moving forward. And just to wrap it up, we know SAV is a vital habitat. Um, SAV in the tidal Delaware is expansive and diverse, um, despite its naturally turbid system. And we recommend continuing to monitor SAV um, as an indicator of water quality and benthic um, habitat and um, hopefully getting a little bit more understanding on habitat suitability to eventually explore the idea of restoration. So with that, I will end my slideshow and stop sharing.
And if anyone has questions, Mike, me, and Todd are all on the phone. Holly, thank you so much. That's really interesting. I use Biosonics equipment for my master's and it's so cool what it can do. Um, so it's neat to see it applied to SAV. Thank you for sharing. Of course. Does anyone have a quick question for Kelly? If we have time at the end, um, we can ask questions then or we can save questions for our next uh, webinar for these presentations. Does anyone have a quick question? And Mike did put the link to our web app in the chat, so please check it out. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. Well, I got off easy. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you're going to be hearing. I a lot teed of it up for you, Andrew. You're going to get all the hard questions. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be hearing questions about that funding source later. Maybe there's an opportunity to do a back bays proposal that partners with, you know, standardize across those two proposals. So very cool. All right. Well, I, Andrew, you can take it away. OK, cool. Um, thanks, everybody. I know that um, meeting ends in seven minutes, so I'll be super quick. Just want to touch on some stuff that we're doing in the inland bays. Um, some of it might be of interest to folks. So the inland bays, Rehoboth, Indian River and Little Last Woman, um, much like the Barnegat Bay, uh, once contained large stands of eelgrass, pre-1930s, eelgrass wasting disease came along, um, basically eliminated those beds. There was some recovery from the 50s through the 70s. Um, that amount of recovery is a little suspect. So there was only two studies done during that entire time period. And one found almost nothing and the other found a lot. And so um, might have reflected some boomer bust issues with when they did the surveys. Um, Regardless, there was a disappearance uh, or a near disappearance of all tidal SAV by the mid 80s. Restoration began um, in, the, um, in the 90s and it, it wasn't consistent. Uh, it happened in spurts and it primarily focused on eelgrass. Um, and there had been no large survey since the mid 80s in our system as well. So uh, sensing a common theme between all of our estuaries and that uh, large surveys for SAV is pretty rare. So we wanted to get a handle on what existed. Uh, and the, the onus of that was um, we had no, we wanted to get involved in SAV restoration and we had no idea where to start. Uh, and so we thought a great place might be to plant on the fringes of existing beds. And so in order to do that, we needed to know where the existing beds were. Um, we secured some funding from Delaware Sea Grant. I'm gonna cruise through the methods here, but um, the map on the right depicts um, the areas that we were able to survey. So Rehoboth Bay is this uh, upper bay here, Indian River, and then the last woman. Um, and the areas in red are where we did map. So we used a combination of um, drone flights. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we used a combination of launching drones from boats to get uh, visuals or take overlapping photographs. Uh, we also performed snorkel surveys. And then importantly for the upper tributary areas and for most of Little Ass Woman, the water is too tannic to use drones or the, um, the tree canopy on the edges of the tribs are overhanging enough where you don't really feel like you're getting an accurate you know, sense of what's going on if you just use your drone. So um, kayak surveys are necessary or manual walking surveys are necessary in a lot of those areas. Um, so we found a lot of vegetated beds like the one on the left, uh, that's um, the little white dots are seagulls for scale. Um, so a lot of pretty expansive vegetated patchworks. Um, and then um, a lot of areas that also look like this on the right. So paddle border for scale there. These are just um, basically single clumps of vegetation. So we steered clear of looking at areas like that. Uh, just didn't feel like it was worth it for the resources. And we focused on areas that had at least a tenth of an acre in vegetation. Um, I'll skip to the results just because we're short on time here. So um, of the 1,600 plus acres we mapped, we only found um, just under 11 acres of grasses. So um, pretty disappointing results. Uh, the majority of that was a uh, one really large contiguous bed of horned pondweed, which isn't even a true seagrass species. Um, and then we had some widgeon grass. Uh, all of the widgeon grass is um, 
coming from uh, an existing wildlife refuge. So these freshwater ponds here are non-tidal and they are stocked with, uh, you know, there's dense widge and grass beds within these and they're managed for waterfowl. There are existing tidal channels, uh, you know, stormwater overflows basically. And so during wet years, it appears that some of the seed from these freshwater ponds is spilling over into the bay and taking root in the tidal portions. Um, so uh, these are areas we might want to target in the future. Since all things considered, if the seed is present, it seems like it's able to take and grow. Um, so I just want to touch a little bit on monitoring as well. So we're just sort of gearing up into this um, into this monitoring phase now that we've finished the mapping. And in order for monitoring to occur for suitability purposes, we really need light at bottom data, sediment data, and temperature data. So we've picked a number of candidate sites um, in conjunction with some, uh, some staff members at DENREC. Uh, most of those areas, so there's two sort of like pie in the sky eelgrass locations that we're holding out hope for, but most of the monitoring locations that I'm focusing on are uh, for widgeon grass and they're focused in one bay where we already had widgeon grass. Um, so We've done some pilot monitoring work um, and, and Dr. Z may have better suggestions, but we've been using the really cheap hobo light temperature pendants. Um, those are wonderful and they only cost like $80. So you can get a lot of them. One of the issues with those is that they don't um, clean themselves. There's no like self wiping mechanism. And so this is the percent light reaching the bottom using those hobo loggers at one site, you can see. On Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it collected normal measurements, and then it immediately fouled by the third day. So that's that clumping. Uh, something's you know blocking the the optical lens. So um, the the workaround is to use Lycor sensors, which are wiped. Those are unfortunately like thirteen thousand dollars a piece to get uh, a self wiping Lycor system. So for the time being, we'll be using the hobo loggers um, and just having to utilize volunteers to to um, you know, keep this fouling events from happening. And then uh, lastly, I know we're short on time, one minute. So um, we are engaging in some um, planting efforts with widgeon grass. Uh, we have a donor bed in South Bethany, uh, a, a township canal system um, that we use seed from. We've also uh, reached out to some folks in Maryland and Virginia for uh, collection permits from their waters. We are, again, still focusing on widgeon grass. You can see the seeds of widgeon grass down here in this image. Um, and we are utilizing a modified oyster tank to process our seed. So um, you basically create a bunch of PVC uh, air vents, and then you hook up several shop vacs. Uh, you put your product in, so your seed heads mixed with you know, the, the shoots of the plant. Uh, you turn on the shop vacs, and it creates basically a washing machine uh, it breaks the seed heads off of the, the uh, plant itself, and then you can just sieve it through a, a whole series of ever smaller and finer mesh bags until you're left with seed at the end. And so this is useful because you can process a lot of material. Nothing has to sit in the tank for a long time. So as long as you have the land space to hold the SAV seed for you know a week or two, you can um, basically batch process and get as much seed as you, um, as you need. And we're targeting uh, restoration along the refuge, as I said. We're looking to plant about seven acres over the next three years. Our hope is that passive restoration would occur, right? So we plant seven, but maybe by the end we have something closer to 12. Um, and I like to use real numbers for budgets just to give folks an idea of what we're talking about. So uh, the ask was about $123,000, and that includes some extensive monitoring for um, biodiversity improvements. Uh, that's something the funder was interested in. So we'll be doing side-by-side -side SANE and eDNA collections uh, at all of our restoration sites over time. Um, and I think that's everything. So I think I nailed it. Uh, one minute over, I'm sorry. Don't apologize. It's my <laughs> fault that we were so pressed for time with the multiple links, so my apologies. Um, but thanks for everyone for sticking on. Um, we will have ample time at the next webinar for questions discussion and I will be putting this um, webinar recording on our team site and I'll summarize um, everything in an email to everyone. Um,
Jesse, do you have anything you'd like to say or close off with? Uh, I mean, great presentations today. Uh, thanks everyone for all that. Um, I just want to say, I mean, I guess since we, all, we unfortunately don't have additional time, um, maybe think about some questions um, and like email them to us for next time. Cause I think it'd be really, really great to kind of brand in the discussion for, for next month. So even like, you know, if you need to take a look again at these presentations, kind of just mull it over. Um, I think it really will aid, um, aid our in our discussions. So please do that. Absolutely. And I'll be reaching out to the folks that volunteered in December to give a primer on their policies and regulations. Hey, Kira. And we'll organize something for our February 23rd meeting. And I will make sure that everyone has the <laughs> same link <laughs> and that we're uh, a little bit better, um, you know, organized for that. So thank you guys for joining and we'll see you February 23rd. Thank you so much, presenters. You did a great job. Fantastic Thank information. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks, Daniel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That was great.